We are now live. Okay. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining. Um, this is session six of the Polyplexus Incubator, the Art and Science of Systems Thinking. And it's been a journey, and we are, we're, we're ending with a bang um, here with a series of workshops with my friend um, and, and master, master curator, teacher, thinker, innovation guru, uh, Tom Lujet. And I'm going to let Tom take it away. Great. Thanks so much, Laura. And, um, and this is going to be fun. I'm, uh, I, I know that all of you are deeply involved in systems thinking, exploring your particular uh, systems discipline through um, uh, the art and science of seeing the world through nodes, links, and territories. And so what, what I'd like to share today are some basic fundamental principles of how we can use images of all types to be able to help us think, help us collaborate, and help us sell ideas uh, more effectively. And in the practice of, of, of doing this, I'll be sharing a number of uh, exercises. So if you haven't all yet already, please get um, a good marker, a blank sheet of paper, um, maybe even a couple of sticky notes as well. So that would be, um, uh, that way you can follow along with the exercises because we want this to be highly participatory as you, as, um, as you cultivate and evolve your skills of, of systems thinking. So as we know, the world is awash in images. Images pervade our online life, our offline life. Um, they, they help frame the world of science, of art, of architecture, of popular culture. Um, and uh, images are, are, are driving cognition, I believe, in, in the world uh, ahead. Um, and uh, we, we live and we think with different kinds of images. Interesting fact, well, assertion that um, uh, according to some researchers, the, the average person today sees, um, or rather the average uh, person living in 16th century England would see uh, about the same number of images as you see in a particular day. You will see more images today than an average person uh, saw in 16th century England during their entire lifetime. So that's pretty interesting. You know, when Google is, is, is asked <clears throat> how many images are posted online, they don't really know the answer. It's between two to three trillion images per year. I mean, it's really pretty astonishing. Now, even though we're very familiar with the images, there is I believe a kind of deep asymmetry that takes place. Even though we're very good at reading and recognizing and understanding images, few of us are really trained in generating images that can help us communicate, help us think uh, more effectively. And so what I'd like to share today are some of the fundamental principles and, and uh, have some uh, fun doing it. Three um, uh, key areas that we're going to look at over the course of the entire um, three workshops. Today we're going to be focus on, focusing on thinking, using images to think, to investigate, to test, to uh, sharpen our mental models. Uh, in our next week's session, we'll focus on uh, using images to collaborate, to work together to help build shared mental models. And then thirdly, uh, we'll spend the third workshop thinking about how we can build uh, standalone graphics that we can use to persuade people, whatever it may happen to be, to explain something to them, to get some funding, to get a grant, whatever it may happen, um, what, what's relevant in, in, um, uh, in your world. So um, the benefits of this is um, we'll deepen our and expand our uh, use of visual thinking uh, today, uh, next week, using images to en engage and align with others, and uh, in the following week to, to communicate and sell. And this, of course, is a means for us to be able to think in systems more effectively. So to kind of get us warmed up, please get your, your sheet of paper and your marker, and I'm going to engage you in a, um, uh, a two-minute exercise. Some of you may have seen this exercise before. It's a popular TED Talk. Um, the exercise was first shown to me by, by uh, great visual thinker, Dave Gray. And it's a, just a fantastic way to think about how um, we think. So here's the situation. You are now, um, you're, you're sitting at a restaurant uh, and you want to order uh, some breakfast, but the waiter speaks no English. You say, I'd like to have some toast. And he goes, Mm -hmm. um, so you take out a, a pen and a paper 
and you start drawing a picture of how to make toast. So what I'd like you to do in two minutes is using um, uh, nothing more than a pen, paper, and no words whatsoever, explain to someone who speaks no English how to make crispy darkened bread. Okay, draw a picture of how to make toast. So now we have um, a few people on the Miro board here. So Miro is an online collaboration tool and we're going to experiment um, by actually having people draw on toast. It's gonna to be a mess, but it's gonna be fun. So this also just gives you a chance to, um, to spend two minutes. So those of you on the Miro board, take the little pen marker and then find the slot and draw a picture uh, with your name in it and draw a picture of how to make toast. You got two minutes, Mark. It's set, go. And those of you, do it at home as well. I will guarantee that deep lessons of uh, uh, creative collaboration and visual thinking will be revealed as you draw your system how to make it. Thirty seconds gone. Nine seconds. Ah. No words. No words. Complete the drawing of how to make. Time's gone. Sixty seconds are left. Six seconds remaining. Ten seconds. seconds. So, um, so there we have, we've got three. So please know that we have rather limited resources here. And, and for some people, this is the very first time they're using um, the, the, the tools, but we've got some three, uh, four really good um, uh, uh, drawings of toast, presumably the bread that goes into a toaster over a period of time. And we see uh, smoke and hot toast. Here we have a systems model of the bread going into the toaster, a bit of heat. So the key elements in, in place here. Uh, here we've got um, um, Farin, you've, I think you've, you've numbered them. So uh, maybe, or, oh, well, no, it's a clock. So we've got a, the uh, toast that goes into the toaster, pops back up again. And then Laura, I know you've been practicing this, <laughs> uh, have done a, a great um, uh, drawing here. So um, here's a, oops, a, um, a picture of that um, people typically make when they're doing a drawing with, a, with a more accessible tools. Uh, the, the bread goes into a toaster, the, the toaster heats up over a period of time, the toast pops up, um, some condiments, voila, uh, a, a, a picture of how to make toast. So I have, believe it or not, over the years collected now about 14 or 15,000 of these drawings and have uh, seen patterns. And so some of the, actually the vast majority of the uh, drawings are uh, uh, simple, easy to understand and clear, which lets us know that we are um, all able to think in systems. Although every once in a while, there are some that you just kind of look and you have, what the, <laughs> no idea I, uh, of what these folks are trying to actually communicate. 
So some people are better at this than others, but we all know how to think in terms of simple pictures that are connected together with, with lines. And um, there are different biases, of course, that happen with different um, uh, mental models. So for some people, they, it, it's, um, the drawing is really about creating um, uh, the, the, uh, <laughs> the, uh, the supply chain. Uh, some people uh, uh, draw the very simple diagrams. Uh, typically CEOs just draw the end result. Um, um, uh, some uh, MBA students typically draw just the, the fire. Uh, engineers typically draw something like this, the process of making toast. Um, and uh, even into the mechanics that illustrates that. Um, some people, especially HR professionals, draw pictures of people making toast because it's a human-centered experience. So their mental model always includes the person. It's a person-centered experience. Um, and uh, some people draw the supply chain uh, that goes all the way back to the store um, and uh, through the transportation networks. Some people go back to the wheat fields um, and, and, and so on. So transportation networks, um, and I think I have one picture of someone that was actually drawn all the way back to the Big Bang. So the point is that we all have different drawings of ostensibly doing the same thing. So that's interesting. So even though we all intuitively know how to make toast, what are the key steps? We mentally punctuate it in different ways when we render it through uh, an image. So when we look at the image, uh, there's common elements. So, so the, the systems model, and I know systems model has a more technical definition, which we'll uh, get to later, but the, the visual model usually consists of nodes and links. So the nodes, of course, are the parts of the system, usually the nouns, the discernible objects, and the links show the flow um, uh, between the systems, um, the, the, the interchange of uh, the sequence of time or the interchange of, 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 um, of energy. Uh, so it's the combination of nodes and links that together create the overall systems model. So there's no, of course, correct systems model, there's no perfect systems model, but there are appropriate models that suit the job that you need to perform. And that's a really, really critical skill, identifying what job the visual model needs to perform for yourself and also the user, the, the recipient of it. So there are biases that occur. Um, most North Americans will uh, include a picture of a toaster. Of course, that's how you make toast with a toaster. But in uh, Central Europe or Northern Europe, most people draw a picture of toast in this way, using a frying pan. Um, so uh, Danes in particular. Um, hmm, and uh, most MBA students uh, draw a picture uh, with um, uh, the flames. I must be the, the cost of tuition. <laughs> I'm not sure exactly why. So, but there are other biases as well. So uh, some time ago, I did a workshop for a group of energy uh, executives and, um, and, and see if you can find a common thread, common element. Well, if you look closely, all of them have uh, electrical connections. And when I pointed it out to them, about 60% of the leadership team of 60 people um, had uh, the electrical connections. Uh, they didn't notice it until I pointed it out to them. So that's interesting. You know, we reflect um, in uh, key ways. Some time ago, I got a, a, a system from a system biologist that shows this system, the wheat that goes into the wheat fields. Whoops, let me show that again. That goes to grain, that goes to the bread, that gets uh, sliced, then toasted, then into waste, and then back to the wheat fields. And so for her, that is a complete um, uh, biological system. Uh, so why draw? Well, drawing allows us to clarify our mental models. It allows us to remember them more effectively. As we'll see, it allows us to solve problems in fresh ways. And um, as we'll see in our final workshop, it allows us to sell ideas. So now what I'd like you to do is to go back to your drawing and ask yourself, how many nodes are in the, the, um, the drawing? So I'll give you a moment to, to, to search on that. Um, bear with me for just a second. Just need to make a little change here. Greg, you have a, um, a fan in the background, which is 
creating a low frequency vibe. So I just have to cover that up with a mask. <laughs> it's just startling there. Um, so um, now most people will have anywhere from three to eight nodes. Uh, and so um, it's important to know the, the, the number of nodes because it helps us discern what function and what task the, the, the model will perform. So those of you who, who produce um, uh, simple drawings, they're, they're, they're easy to process, they're clear, they're to the point, but they don't contain an awful lot of information. Um, those who contain uh, shows systems models with lots will produce often the following effect. So, so wait for it. Here it is. So do you feel it? It's called, it's called map shock, where it's like, whoa, it's too much. And that's because we shift into type two thinking. We go from simple, got it, in just one visual glance to um, another mode of thinking where we need to engage another uh, form of processing to be able to make sense of the diagram. So there's actually a sweet spot between five and 13 nodes where we, when we uh, deliver a systems model or a diagram to someone who can, um, so it, we, we, we get that sweet spot between, I get the gist of it and I need to do a little bit of work. And that's typically where, where these uh, visual diagrams are most useful. Um, we'll see, on the other hand, there are diagrams that are insanely complicated. Uh, this is um, uh, a systems model that illustrates um, the, the factors for obesity. You know, if you think about what causes obesity, well, it's not just food, in caloric input and output. There are multiple systems. In fact, this shows clusters and, and nested hierarchies and layers of systems that contribute to each other. Um, the, um, uh, Crystal, the, the U.S. general, I think, um, produced um, a systems model that was quite popular. When, and and uh, every person coming to Afghanistan would need to look at this model to see the complexity. So it perhaps doesn't show the full links and it is perhaps not um, fully um, rigorous. But what it does do is it encourages people to uh, compare and contrast ideas in a way that uh, PowerPoint typically doesn't. Typically, but this has got well over <clears throat> uh, 40 nodes, so a lot of processing. But of course, the world of nature um, is far more complex. So when we look at the pathways um, of, um, uh, the, of molecular uh, channels, my goodness, it's incredibly complicated. So the world doesn't care about systems models. Um, the world just works in the way that it, it, it does. But uh, since we have limited cognitive resources and since we need to communicate in time and space with others, um, there's a calibration dial that we can um, uh, use when we both think and also when we both um, uh, communicate with others. Sometimes we want to simplify the model, sometimes we want to enrich. And in my professional consultancy, um, helping organizations create systems models and visual models of their, their business and business challenges, we go back and forth. Sometimes it's all about simplifying it and making it super clear so that you get it in a type one uh, format. And other times it's um, about en enriching. So what if we use different tools for a creative collaboration? Instead of drawing, what if we used um, markers and sticky notes? So something really interesting happens here. Um, we typically produce uh, uh, more distinct nodes, typically more nodes, and people often have a conversation with the nodes as they produce them, adding, moving them around in a non-linear way. Uh, so as they form the process or the structure, they interact with the no nodes, and that um, typically produces a, a richer um, interrogation with, with the ideas. So drawings have this distribution of nodes, cards have a richer distribution of nodes. So the ease with which you can change your visual representation of the model corresponds with your ability to update and improve the model. So the ease with which you can uh, change the physical nodes with it, um, the, you, you typically can produce a faster um, a, a better model more clearly because you can iterate with lower friction. So what if you engaged a, a whole team to create a, the best possible model? So what if you had five people all with their own mental models of how to draw toast? So it typically starts off as a cluster, well, a mess, um, and then through some facilitation, uh, guiding people to um, normalize them, bring similar nodes together. 
And what happens in that cr uh, collaborative process is many things. People get to see and acknowledge and build on and compare and contrast other models, but they typically build the richest and most complete models because they incorporate the diverse opinions from other uh, points of, of view. So the, the lessons for us are drawings allow us to see our mental models, sticky notes allow us to have a conversation with them. We won't be doing much of that today, but next week we will. And group notes will allow us to create the, the richest and most collaborative models, building in engagement and collaboration. So it's a powerful tool for us to um, do those three things that I uh, had talked about, think, collaborate, and to sell. So you probably aren't gonna draw a picture of how to make toast, ever again, but you might draw how to explain a process or illustrate a, pro a um, structure or explore alternatives or, um, or, or much, much more. And so in the chat uh, at the end of this, I'd love to know what are some of the problems that you would like to solve using visual thinking? Actually, we'll do that during the Q&A. Um, and, and what are the types of diagrams that might be useful for you to help you get work done? So um, during the course of our, our conversation today, um, we will focus on five key areas. So the first is thinking a bit more about images and how images work in the sense of um, if we could create a systems model of how we see images, what would that look like? Uh, secondly, is to, to think about the visual components of systems. Third is to dive a little bit more deeply into nodes. Four is about exploring territories, another aspects, aspect of visual system thinking, and links. And at the end also, I'll, I'll share some, um, we'll, we'll move from the kind of the simple hand-drawn to high fidelity interactive 3D visualizations um, that um, uh, of, of how technology can augment uh, these, these tools. Uh, or these, these processes. So um, images. So if you were to, to draw, actually, why don't you go ahead and do this now? Why don't you draw a picture of um, the process of visual cognition? What happens? What would be the nodes and the links? And those, the neuroscientists in uh, the audience will probably go, oh, are you kidding me? There are so many elements. That's ridiculous. But if you broke it down to the top, five or six nodes and or links, what would that look like? So I'm just gonna let you think about that. And of course, as you think about that and express it, you, you, there's a dynamic relationship between the, the mental model and the visual model. It's interesting, sometimes we think our visual models are super crisp until we actually draw them and we think, oh, hmm, maybe maybe I wasn't so, so clear. So here's the, probably the simplest model of cognition, the world of thoughts, whatever that looks like. And then the world of physical images, we know what those look like. And then there's a process where we can externalize our thoughts and then a process where we can take images and internalize our thoughts. So of course, this is a, a very simple representation of, of the overall process, but it's a useful tool for us to think about different aspects of of systems models, helping us look at different classes of images, uh, understand how we make sense of them, what's the process, um, and then how we can take those diffuse mental images and use a visual language to create better imagery and so on. So sometimes, um, so there's a kind of a loop that, that, can, that, that can happen. Um, and sometimes we do it, as, as I mentioned, with other people as well. We're for today going to focus just on this particular domain. So let's look at um, uh, images. Let's go to the Miro board, and uh, I'm going to invite um, the, the Miro participants to look at a few images here um, and to draw, to move them in, kind of categorize them. So you, what you can do is you can click any one of these, uh, pick it, and then move it around. And where would it go? So I'm going to, I put this little simple, over simple classification of conceptual images. Um, here of um, uh, abstract images and realistic images. And uh, so if you're gonna drag and drop these, where would the picture of Elon Musk go, Mickey Mouse go, the word idea, the graphic of the outdated version of an elect of a, an atom. Uh, 
So go ahead and start pick, use the little arrow, drag them across. So we've got Yeah, simple. So we've just taken a few images and um, and, and created a, a simple categorization, and um, in the process, simple uh, simple collab collaboration. Images perform, perform many jobs. They help us think, they help us increase memory, they help us focus attention, they introduce structure, they can reinforce text, they can make uh, ideas far more concrete, uh, they create a shared visual space and they invite collaboration. So uh, images can bring attention to a topic in a way that text simply can't. They can establish a sense of reality of how the world works, even though it might be incomplete or outdated. Um, it sets a sense of context. Images can actually drive um, belief um, for hundreds, if not thousands of years, even though there may not be a whole lot of um, rigorous science behind it. Simple images, such as these Feynman um, uh, diagrams, uh, allow us to, to think, take a quite a complex uh, 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 subject of the decay of, of uh, subatomic particles and, and see the relationships uh, of them, how they connect together. Uh, images can introduce structure and help us look at super complex um, distribution and, and see the flow, if, for example, as in the Sankey diagram or a little um, uh, deeper Sankey diagram and even this deeper Sankey diagram here um, uh, produced by, by uh, Saul uh, Griffith from, from uh, uh, other labs. And this is just a tiny little snapshot. I think he and his team spent probably a year and a half creating the most robust and complex and rich um, uh, diagram showing the flow of energy uh, throughout the United States. So um, you can, you can, um, it's, it's a fantastic Google. You probably spend an hour just going uh, and looking just at, at the details of it. So images take, you know, allow us to communicate in many ways. And um, what I find particularly interesting here uh, in Canada is that there's only just like uh, five looks like hotspots in Canada. So we're good with COVID when you represent the data wrongly. <laughs> We're just as red as everyone else. Um, and uh, um, the future of, of uh, visualization in some domains is to actually create visualization studios or rooms where we can uh, offload the cognitive cost of everything in our head and, and use our what is called our spatialization memory. More on that in, in the later workshops. So images take many different forms and serve many different functions and we could um, uh, do a multi-hour week course just on the history of imagery just in, in the sciences. So how do we make sense of, of images? Well, um, here, I want to show you a couple of demonstrations. So two quick quizzes. So um, find out what state is missing. Anyone? Which state is missing? Not much time. Quick, quick, quick. OK, let's try it again. Which state is missing? Oh, right. When we, we see it in the form of a picture, um, we can see that Washington state is missing. But um, visually, we uh, uh, in a text, it's hard to see. Um, well, it's just cheating. You're just using a picture. Well, that's the point. When we put an idea into the form of a visual representation, we use different mental pathways and we can process information in different ways. Not necessarily better, but in uh, other ways. So here's another example. So here's um, um, someone explaining to someone else, a colleague, about the project that they're working on, the pitch, and who they need to pitch to. So Frank is the leader of the division, um, and Abe is the head of the design team. Jan, Tom, and Sam work for Abe. Got it? Okay, Sally is the head of the engineering team. Jules, Jill, and Gord report to Sally. Abe, Tom, Sam, and Jules are on the innovation proposal. And Jules and Abe are supportive of it, uh, but Tom and Sam are not. Got it? Hard to do. It's a, a huge amount of cognitive load to keep that in our uh, uh, brain. And uh, what if we did it visually? 
So Frank is the head of the group. Um, Abe is the head of the design division. Jan, Tom, and Sam report to him. Uh, Sally is in the engineering group, and according to her is Jules, Jill, and Gord. Uh, there's the innovation project people, there's four of them, and two are on board, two are not. Compare that with that, that with that, okay? So an image, even though it can take more time to produce, becomes a, a powerful tool to make sense of things and also to collaborate with others. Because once it's offloaded, it lowers the cost, it frees the mind to be able to perform other higher level functions, such as what's the relationship with between Abe and Jules and what and so on and so on. So you can build up and use this as a canvas to be able to think ideas, think through the questions in more ways. Okay, I'm gonna give you um, uh, 20 seconds to look at this graphic and now pay attention to where your eyes move as you make sense of it. Where does it go? As you make sense of it and as you are reading it, of course, visual thinking isn't simultaneous, although it can feel simultaneous some of the time. So, the process is actually multi multi step. So I, light goes through our eyes in a complex pattern. It crosses um, in complex ways. It goes to the primary visual cortex, to the back of the eye, um, and here the uh, um, the signals are re, -ra re radiated to about forty to thirty five or forty different sub processing parts of of the brain, um, and each performs a different function. I don't have a full visualization. Um, of this, I did this some years ago when this was long, took long and hard to, to make, but there were parts of the brain that, that make sense of um, place, make sense of how, that makes sense of words, that recognize faces. There's even a place in the brain that recognizes cartoon faces. So it's, it's remarkable. And, um, and of course there's places deep um, in, in, inside the brain, uh, the limbic side, where we get uh, a, the limbic part of the brain, which uh, we, where we get uh, emotional uh, re responses. So um, the brain is, 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 is if, if you were to guess what portion of the surface of the brain um, is dedicated to, to um, different parts of, uh, of, of uh, perceptual processing, how would you move these little icons onto the, the this four by four checkerboard? What portion would be sight? What would be, portion would be touch, taste, hearing? What portion would be smell? And it looks like this. So that's pretty interesting. And this is a great uh, diagram from Dan Rome. Um, so even though our brain the, the, um, is, is highly skewed to visual processing, incredibly uh, adept, how much do we actually use it in everyday meetings and everyday um, uh, uh, communication? And, it, and it, it turns out not that much. And that's a shame because when we don't take advantage of how our brain processes information, we lose the opportunity to be able to communicate more clearly and to drive our points home. Um, we also lose the opportunity to, bear, to build shared visual spaces um, to create uh, pictures of everyday systems to help us make sense of things. And as a result, that leads to miscommunication and misinformation. So if we were going to simplify that visualization before, um, kind of looks like this. There are pathways that takes information from the eyes to the back of where there's the primary uh, cortex. Um, and then there are different channels that process the what part of the brain. So, you know, the tangible visual representation, the who recognizing um, the, the identity or, you know, nature of the person, where something takes place. And I, there's actually a, a several where um, platforms uh, um, and, then, um, and then how. So vast oversimplification, just a few nodes to get the, make some of the key uh, points. So when we, we are interrogating this image visually, there's a, a, a deep amount of processing that takes place. You know, here's, here's a, a, a lovely illustration called change blindness. That, that shows the limitations of visual thinking. 
And so um, let me just show this to you. You're about to see two images switching back and forth in rapid succession. See if you can spot the difference between them. Keep your gaze fixed on the center. So two images. There is actually a big difference. And now that I know where it is, it's super easy to find. But when you don't know, <laughs> it's really hard. Pay attention to the trousers worn by the man on the far left and see what happens. You cannot not see it. It's interesting um, when we, um, uh, when there's a, a, a flash that goes between, or when, there's, when there's two images that flick back and forth, we see the difference. But when we introduce a, um, like an 80 to 120 millisecond uh, blank flash between the two, it interrupts the saccadic movements of our eyes and prevents us to be able to see the changes. It really demonstrates um, uh, how we mentally construct images. Here you go. You cannot not see it. <laughs> um, so, you know, when we look at images, uh, 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 and, and I'm, I'm told that when we have images of brains uh, on a, we, we increase the IQ uh, of, of our, um, uh, the perception of the IQ of the speaker by five points. I'm totally making this up. Um, but when we put little kittens, we increase the, the EQ by 10 points. The point here <laughs> is that when our eyes begin to flick back and forth, um, we are processing information. Our eyes naturally want to dart between the eyes, between the nose, the whiskers, and we uh, naturally, with a spirit of curiosity of scientific investigation, begin to see the differences and the similarities. And that's true in cute, cuddly uh, pictures. They are really cute, aren't they? Um, and it's also true of, um, of uh, 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 analytical data, where we compare and contrast um, uh, land use in North Korea, for example. So the brain is hardwired to make meaning and there's a sophisticated set of processes that are uh, um, taking place for us to make sense of the imagery that we see. I mean, think about it as you look around the environment that you're in, um, the, the books that are surrounding you, the, 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 um, uh, uh, the art that is behind you, lots is going on. If we can understand the, the language that's taking place, we can make it easier for us to uh, express, formulate ideas, and also easier to, to communicate ideas, which leads us to our next section of, of systems. So we, we've kind of gone around the ring now, and uh, let's look at the, the process of once you have an image in your mind of a topic, draw how to make toast, or something much more sophisticated, how do I get my grant approved? How do I communicate this idea in a paper so people get it more clearly? What's the process for me to um, uh, get uh, 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 you know, a, a higher recognition among my peers of the amazing work that I do? All of that can be, can be uh, gone through, uh, uh, formulated through a process. And if we were to oversimplify it, there is a process of there is a process of formulating ideas from diffuse to some type of image base, um, you know, moving from equations, from words to images, putting it into a visual language, representing it through a physical act of drawing, and then externalizing it. So there are separate steps. And by getting good at each of these steps, we dramatically improve our capacity to um, uh, to, to make this happen. So we kind of don't even have words to explain this because it's not a verbal process. It's, it's, a, it's a visual process. You know, when we think of what a system is, um, a system can be any self-contained entity from, you know, biological systems to physical systems to industrial and social and economic systems. And each one of them can be represented in different ways. But of course, there's no single correct way of illustrating them, just as there's no single correct way of illustrating how to make toast, but there are useful models as well. And um, the, the, the fundamental components of a system, as we've already seen, includes nodes and links, but there's also a third element as well, which is the territory, which is the overall arrangement. So nodes uh, constitute the individual 
um, component parts, territories are the overall uh, group and links represent the flow or the interchange uh, be between each of them. When we uh, articulate and understand these, we can create a more accurate representation of the entity, the thing that we're trying to produce. And it can be devilishly difficult to do this. You know, often we, we look at diagrams like the DNA molecule um, or models like the DNA molecule, which is seems simple and intuitive now, but the act and the process of researching and discovering it can be really challenging. Often I look at uh, simple infographics. I've actually been working on some some uh, projects, and it's quite literally taken me some years to over, you know simplify and get to the essence of um, of certain um, uh, business representations. Um, so nodes um, can take different um, forms. They can be arranged into different territories or different structures. Those territories can be bounded. And so they can have additional meeting, uh, and then there can be links that uh, connect them. I'm missing this slide. Okay. Um, and so there are uh, different uh, classes. So by so by changing the nature of the nodes, how they're represented, what's included and what's not included, by figuring out the nature of the territory, what's the pattern by which you um, uh, organize them. Uh, and by selecting the kinds of links that organize them together, you create different models. And so there are models that can be very visually accurate, you know, accurate uh, maps of systems. And then there can be maps, uh, ones that can be incredibly abstract, like um, catastrophe, catastrophe theory and uh, phase um, uh, visualiz visualizations and so on. But they all kind of build on the same elements of nodes, territories and links with multiple variations. And so, um, so that's a really important point. Uh, and, and through the rest of the entire program, we'll be thinking in terms of what are the nodes, the const constituent parts, how do they fit together in organizational patterns? Um, how do we rework the patterns to serve different functions? And how do we identify the links from just um, simple relationships to causal links to links that we can computationally uh, model? So there's levels and layers to all of this. And so what I found in, in teaching systems thinking and watching people learn systems thinking is that people often kind of go through a, um, um, uh, a set of, of, of stages here where they um, will kind of at the early stages um, go from what's a system to uh, a, a system uh, model. And it's a way to, um, to talk about a system Think about it, systems model, and they um, have concepts in, in their head that illustrate the model, but they don't actually draw it out. There's actually quite a big leap I've found um, for, for people. I've worked with folks who, um, system strategists, um, I had a boss who, who talked about systems model, but I've never ever actually saw him draw one. <laughs> um, and uh, so the step of, of actually um, drawing a physical model is a big leap. And then there's actually other leaps from there when we can computationally um, figure out the elements and what are the, um, the nodes and links and then create a computational model and so on and so on. So you know, there's a whole spectrum of, of, of skills. So this, this, this underlying structure actually fits within all of them. So it's, it's a critical skill. And you know, one type of, of visual way, one way of thinking visually is is to, to, to imagine that each of us have uh, an executive team sitting in our head. So we have a CEO who makes decisions, the CMO, the chief marketing officer, chief technology officer, operating officer, strategy officer, and financial officer. And it's the combination of them that make um, the, the decisions that we need to make to run the, the business of our lives. And each has a preferred way, typically way of thinking. So a CEO will like to see what the vision looks like. The CMO, marketing connects to the needs of customers and the, the, um, the, the products that are, that are served. The technology officer is the, uh, illustrates the flowchart. Operating officer knows what are the steps to make things happen. The strategy officer you know, has the overall context of where the, we'll go and the financial officer will, will, will measure things. Oversimplification, absolutely. Um, but uh, again, this is um, um, a drive from Dan Rome, who's written wonderful books on this subject. So what, as we begin to understand and kind of dive through these different um, uh, aspects of 
we can dramatically increase our language of, of, of visual uh, thinking. So I'm going to, um, let's see here. We're going to go into a drawing exercise now. So what I actually would like to do is just take a couple of minutes for questions. Um, and so if there are, are questions at this point, I'll, I'll field a few. For the rest of you, please go get some drawing tools, some um, uh, markers, some 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 paper, uh, a tablet, a Wacom tablet, whatever you've got, whiteboard, um, and uh, so we can use the the next say three minutes or so just to uh, also have a bit of a break and to uh, field some questions. So, Laura, um, uh, do you have see any questions that are coming in, um, and or do you have questions that you would like to to ask? So there's a there's a theme about the tendency, um, maybe science and otherwise, but for, particularly for science and technical types to resist, to passionately resist simplification. Mm -hmm. if any, you have any tips for how to get folks who are proud of the complexity of their, of their processes or their, their work and to help simplify it for these purposes? I, I think the per the, so I, I I my background is astrophysics and, and physiological psychology. I, I was a creative director of um, Canada's largest museum for for many years. My tendency in developing planetarium shows and museum structures is to show the whole thing because if you want to um, explain what a galaxy um, is, you absolutely have to illustrate uh, adiabatic fluctuations and blah, 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 blah. And, um, and I, I certainly uh, saw in the museum clients and customers and visitors um, that when they checked out, you know, after nine or 10 seconds of my conversation, it was absolutely on them to just not be able to follow the beauty and the, the richness of what, wait, what, wait a second. As a communicator, it's our job to inspire, to communicate, and to enrich the lives of the people that we serve. So um, after a, a few ridiculously bad planetarium shows and, and, and um, uh, horrible museum exhibits that were essentially textbooks, um, I learned um, what job I needed to perform. And I think as, as uh, science professionals, we need to have, wear different hats. So. Um, you know, with when we are in the domain of, of working with our um, our peers and colleagues and, and students, yeah, you go into the multi-node complexity, and that's um, that's really useful because that's where the intricacy is, and that's where the, the science takes place. We're going to look at some examples of that with um, periodic tables. But for other purposes, for people who are perhaps decision makers who don't get it, or for lay people who or people who don't understand your discipline. Um, it, um, you know, clarify what job you want to perform, what what communication task you want to to um, uh, uh, achieve. I've I've learned. Um, my wife is is from the arts, and so when I geek out about um, um, whatever, uh, I I know to switch modes and to to speak in in a form that is um, not the way I, I would read in it. You know, in the form that that would be delivered in science. So, um, so I think, uh, you know, loosen that up. <laughs> you know, um, uh, it, just because someone is is not clearly um, at the level that, that you are, you don't need to bring them there necessarily, or they may not want to. So, it's also as a as an excellent communicator, know the, where your your um, uh, your your uh, audience is at and speak to the level that is is there. That's one of the challenges of online tools because I can't see you. So I have no idea with the with the body language, the eye movement, the head movement, if I'm um, at a, well, this is just kindergarten level or, hey, just slow down, this is new to me. So that's again, one of the big uh, challenges of this. So I've kind of taken the simpler step-by-step, uh, -step. but those of you who are um, familiar with this, trust me, we will go into the equivalent of adiabatic fluctuations. <laughs> Tom, do you consider um, doodling, that thing that almost all of us did as kids and teenagers, and most of us seem to stop doing? Um, we, do, we, we check our phones now instead of doodling during meetings. And what, 
do you see that as a as a gateway drug back to to visual thinking? Um, you bet. As practice. Um, so doodling is a is a is an interesting term. There. Um, so um, I. There's a wonderful book called um, Art Before Breakfast. And I would um, encourage uh, everyone to, um, to uh, sorry, just uh, my, there was a big change in my camera here. So everything seems to be okay. So sorry, there's a, something that happened. Um, Art Before Breakfast, it's, it's just a wonderful book um, that, explores um, what you might do um, before or during your, your morning cup of coffee to stir your imagination. So there's wonderful drawing exercises um, that, 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 that illust illustrate them. Drawing is, is, a, is a way to externalize ideas um, and it's a, it's a powerful tool to um, make sketches, to, to make collaboration work. So I draw on, on a tablet pretty much all the time. Um, over the, I don't want to show customer clients. Okay. Okay. Here's some, um, some doodles that, um, actually, I don't think I did very good doodles during our conversations. Let me find something that's, um, oh, maybe here. So when I have, have conversations with colleagues, I draw the, the conversations. So these are some drawings that I make during the course of conversations. And um, though it doesn't actually necessarily make a whole lot of sense to someone not there, the act of drawing it out in person is, is just simply um, um, uh, talking. Uh, Mario and I are giving a keynote presentation tomorrow, um, and we are thinking about how we can what, how we can encourage our audience to make a shift in their thinking, feeling, in action. Um, and uh, we're talking about housing prices and so on. So on here are some of our goals. Um, and so I've made now I think it's like forty thousand sketches with uh, my customers over the, the last uh, 15 years or so. I actually developed this software called Sketchbook many years ago. And so um, this simple act of um, drawing out ideas uh, nested in, I can go to essentially any meeting at any um, time and find out who was there, um, what were some of the big ideas um, and uh, what were the topics that we were exploring and, and, and so on. So in a way that visual, that rec regular notes just don't do. So doodling good, because especially when you do with, with others, because it creates a shared visual framework. Again, we'll talk about that next, uh, uh, next, next, um, next week. We want to do one more question before we move on. Sure. Um, go ahead, Alicia. Hi, I just was curious whether you could comment on the variations between people. So, for example, I fall into the category, if there is such a thing, I've never doodled, I don't ever see the point of doodling, um, I'm not a very visual person. So, when you sort of show the pictures of, you know, whatever many percentages of uh, visual part of brain versus everything else, I'm wondering how much that varies between people. Um, a lot. There, there is, um, as you'd expect, a quite a distribution of the the, the skills and um, the, the the approaches. You know, it, it, I, I've not. I'm not familiar with the um, the detailed um, the you know formal tests of visual literacy. Um, there, there are some you know interesting. Um, Kind of frameworks in teaching visual literacy that there's sort of broadly three classes of, of people where um, the, the lion's share, say 70% fit into, uh, yeah, give me the marker and I'll go up uh, to the whiteboard, but you need to encourage me. And then there's the 15% who will go, well, before we say anything, let me just draw stuff out onto the wall. And then there's the 15% of Nope, nope, you know, I'm, I'm not a visual person. I don't think visually. Um, and so there are, there are different um, approaches to engage and with, with, with each. 
So the, 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 the keeners, the early adopters, if you will, will um, are the ones who will take these visual um, methods um, as will the, the 70, um, 70%. These are typically called the black marker people because they immediately take the black marker and they go to the wall. The um, yellow marker folks are the ones that will um, highlight and um, augment. And then there is the red ones, which is not going to appear red on red. So I'll just make it white, um, who uh, will, once everyone's up on the front of the room and are, are making their, their, their points, will go, no, that's wrong and that's right. <laughs> so there's a, a, a um, uh, multiple entry points, if you will. So folks who, um, who do the, the act of creation, those who do the modification, and those who will do the assessment. And in fact, when we get later, go, go into the uh, later courses, um, there again is a spectrum of the use of these tools. So you may not um, be interested um, or uh, you know, have the, the wiring to, to, to think in this way, but you think in other ways through equations or through poetry, words, or whatever it may happen to be. Um, and, um, uh, but you can certainly build on and rely on others to comment. So there's a whole range of voting and alignment tools that um, uh, for, for individuals for whom visual thinking is not their, their, their preferred mode of, of, of thinking. But how do, I mean, there's the comfort level with drawing, you know, sort of like getting, getting banished from math as a kid because somebody told you you weren't good at it or something, something traumatic happened. And it's been shown over and over again that a much wider group of folks are perfectly capable of learning higher mathematics. They just were taught it really poorly or not encouraged. And I, I would say just anecdotally, the same is true of drawing. That at some point really early, you're told they're artistic, you're not, or I'm smart and hierarchical or this way, rational versus creative. And it gets shut up. So I, I, would, I would fight that 15% um, and say, I'm not sure where you that got quashed. And it doesn't matter if you're good at it. It matters like for, for the purpose of these workshops. Is it useful? Is it useful for you to have some sort of visual something, kinetic haptic reaction in your process of thinking? Yeah, I, I, I would encourage um, uh, you. And the big disadvantage of working virtually is I can't see you and I can't make moment to moment feedback comments uh, on you. I can't see you starting a draw drawing of um, um, a process or a structure and then uh, provide individual uh, introductions. Hopefully, you know, later on in the second and third section sessions, people will say, you know, I'm, I'm, I'd like to do this, but I don't know where to start. But to your, to your um, earlier point, yeah, you bet. Why don't we do some drawing <laughs> um, and talk about the blocks of the drawing and talk about that magic moment that just about every professional has where they go, huh, I'm not going to draw. What is that? So let's get on to our, our, our next uh, session. So everyone got their drawing um, tools. Now we'll do a bit of, of drawing. And drawing is, is really an, an iterative process like writing, like formulating an equation, like computer programming, like learning how to juggle of, of an iterative of external and internal loop. Um, we, the the um, um, a process really begins uh, when you're drawing an image from your imagination is you begin with the concept and then you express it visually and then you reflect on it and then you make moment to moment changes. This happens over multiple stages. So let's actually play this out and you can identify where you're comfortable and where you get stuck um, in this process. This is actually part of a larger program that we teach at um, a program called Wicked Problem Solving, um, which I'll talk a little bit about later. Um, but it's, it's, um, so first of all, you need good tools. So I've, um, the, the tools typically include uh, blank uh, markers, large sheets of paper, good stock, and markers that um, um, uh, where you can vary the line width. So pen or pencil, not so much. Um, and that allows you to make drawings like this. I, again, I've... I, 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 I'm a, a long-term Tedster uh, conference, that's where Laura and I met, and I've been drawing TED since 1993. So I always go with four or five notebooks and I fill them out. 
Um, another tool is is um, uh, uh, a tablet, right? So an, an iPad. Um, get it if you're into, really into it. Get a paper-like screen protector, and that is just it, it gives more tooth to the drawing. Um, um, and pick the right kind of tablet. So I have I have both. I've I live in this world and develop software in this world. So I have all sorts of of these at all sizes. Um, uh, Wacom tablet. This is a picture of the one that I'm drawing on now. It's a small one, 16 inches, and we've got 24 and 32 inches in the other production suites. Um, and then also um, uh, uh, tools for visual thinking here, um, and then uh, boards for visual thinking. So um, also parts of the studio. So um, you know, in the development of the course, here are some drawings to help uh, me organize and see the systems model. So the externalization of the idea and make creating a large canvas is a powerful tool when you're dealing with complexity. So to your, your question, Elisa, of, of like, well, I, I don't draw, but do you need to manage complexity? Do you need to manage a sequence? Do you need to see how things fit together? Um, you know, you, you might be blessed with one of those minds where you can keep everything in your imagination. Sadly, I do not have one of those. So um, I think that's one of the reasons that I went into this because I could make sense of things in ways that I couldn't uh, otherwise. Okay, got your drawing tools. Um, first thing, um, how do you hold your pen? Uh, and secondly, how do you stand? So um, drawing will let you, um, you know, have an erect um, uh, posture and an L or a, a corner with your, with your elbow. And um, let's see. Uh, yeah, let's actually go here. Um, I love this quote from Paul Clay, the, the artist, when he talks about drawing and learning to draw. And that is a line is a dot going for a walk. Just a, a great. Um, uh, phrase. So there, fundamentally, there are four ways you can take your dot for a walk. Let's practice them. And in practicing them, I want you to be deliberate with how you make marks. So this is not writing, this is drawing. And as you draw, um, the difference is that you're moving your whole arm. Writing typically is with your wrist. And that is makes a big difference. So what I'd like you to do now is to take a couple of minutes on your um, sheet of paper don't, or your iPad, you don't need to do it on a mirror board and just start making some, some lines. Uh, we're gonna take a couple of minutes and I'm gonna do it in the background as well. I think I've got some music here, smooth groove. Oh yeah, good. So um, start making some straight lines, vertical, horizontal, you can make them fast, make them slow, make them thick. And, um, geez, it's kind of like you're playing, like you're in kindergarten. Yeah. So great artists know about the power of line. They can express emotion in a line. I've seen um, artists just, you go, wow, that, is, that line is angry, that line is sad. And move to the curved line. Take some curves, so. The difference is that um, here the, the dot changes direction. So as you draw, make little changes of directions consciously. You're making slow and rapid turns, and that's what you're instructing your hand to do. So at the lowest cognitive level, getting this right, it becomes a tool so you don't have to think about it. You don't go into writing mode. You go into writing mode, um, the drawings look like crap. <laughs> then switch to corner. So in corner, you uh, make a line and then you make an abrupt turn, a hard left or a hard right, still not taking your pen off the marker, off the, the, the paper. So make a bunch of jag lines and then jump. Jump is about taking your pen off off the paper, and then uh, making uh, small, medium, large uh, little lines. And they can be curved lines. So these four simple movements are all you need to be able to draw. And so becoming familiar with the feeling of that, feeling comfortable with that, 
is uh, the critical aspect of visual thinking. So when we go and have moved from um, let's see, a uh, just narrow this line down a bit. So I can make lines like that. That's not so great if I can make stronger lines here do that. Um, you know, I can make lines like this. Um, a bolder line is stronger. Um, lines like this, lines like this. So in the same way, when we need to communicate clearly with words, not using too many words, not using too few words, the same is true of visual imagery. Use the, express the, the idea in a clear, concise, accurate way. And that's reflected in how you take your dot for a walk. So now we would do uh, a couple of hours of actual working, drawing, and so on. But we're not going to do that now <laughs> um, because of this. So we can um, kind of combine these together to. Oh, uh, here's some examples of this and not this, this, but this. And then we can draw um, basic shapes as well. So now what I'd like you to do is, um, let's see, I want to be mindful of time here. Um, yeah, let's, let's do this. Just follow along with me. And um, I'd like for you to, to learn the, the basic alphabet of, of, of drawing. The basic alphabet is dots, lines, get this a little thicker here. Um, circles, squares, triangles, arrows, squiggly lines, and so on. And from this, you can make just about anything. So in the art before breakfast, should you try to do this, uh, take this, this great little morning before, uh, 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 drawing before uh, coffee class, um, the, 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 you, you can kind of go through these and it's really a, a fun way to loosen up and kind of clear your brain um, and uh, not read the morning newspaper, <laughs> the doom scrolling. Um, and we can learn that by drawing simple shapes and then adding them together, we can create um, different uh, types of, 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 of elements. And so, um, you can see we've got squares, triangles, and so on. And so we're drawing like, um, like a five-year-old. And so whether it's buildings that we're uh, creating, subatomic atoms, or sub atoms done in the old, is this the Rutherford model? So yeah, simple elements. So go ahead and, and do some some drawings like this. Virtually anything that you see in your environment as you look around it can be constructed out of these different shapes. Look at the windows, the tables, the sink, the books, the lights, the plants, the, I don't know what that is, the ears, <laughs> the astrolabe that's in the back um, there, um, the computer keyboard, all of these can be drawn from component parts. And when you feel comfortable with it, you get uh, better and better. So, I, I, you know, we, we this the, now is not the time. <laughs> uh, we to, to uh, uh, this is something that you really should practice on your own. But as you do, you noticeably can can become better. I think later on we're going to send you some links to books and other resources. So if you're interested to expand and deepen and grow this part of your brain, um, these are um, the, the natural starting points. Okay, so now I'd like everyone to draw uh, a picture of a person. So. Go ahead and do that. Draw a picture of a person. And for, for many of you, and then may, for probably many of you who are on the red uh, red pen marker line, but not everyone, you'll, your picture might look like, like that. Um, and so as a leader of, um, of a multinational or as a leader of a, of a uh, uh, you did with many papers published, 
you're not going to feel comfortable necessarily showing a picture of that because your status as a, as a, in the discipline that you you mastered um, suddenly seems to to drop. This is where people um, stop. It's a, it's a choke hold. It's a choke point that that literally stops the development of of visual thinking um, because when we go through the process of express um, and reflect, the reflect is uh oh, and it grinds the process down to a, a halt. So um, one of the, the great kickstarts is to figure out how to draw your, um, uh, I, I'm gonna skip this exercise, different ways of drawing people. One of my favorite um, is this method here. It's also um, uh, called the Dave Gray method where you go through several steps where you first begin with the body, then the head, then add a couple of legs, some arms, eyes, and a little nose, a little accent on the feet, and um, um, and then kind of color it in. So go ahead and draw this now. Take the step of actually starting number one with the, um, the little rectangle on the left, draw a head on the top, draw those two legs, draw the two arms, Draw two dots for the eyes. Looks like there's a dot for, for the mouth as well, and the nose. And then add a cap, and then add a little bit of width. And we've um, dramatically expanded. So you might want to compare that drawing with your first drawing, and um, and it, um, it 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 might be a lot better. So now I'd like you to draw a picture of a. Um, hockey player taking a shot, a slap shot, in the same way. What would that look like? So we're building on the skill. It's body, then head, then two legs. Maybe put some skates on it. Two arms, hockey stick, and face. So what might that look like? Body, skate, another skate. Um, let's put one arm down here, another arm down here. The hockey stick is here, up to the head in the wrong. And so, and then you can color it in and try different things as well. So what we've done is we've changed that um, ref that cycle of imagine, express, and reflect. So this is a little systems model, little diagram that we've just added some additional nodes to it and um, interrupted and figured out where the block was. So even as something as simple as how do you draw can be represented by a simple visual model that you could then interrogate. Is the problem with the imagination? We can all imagine a, a, a player, but the problem often is, or the, the, the block, we don't know how to represent it. Now that we have the language of, hey, I just need to um, put these little uh, uh, shapes in like this, Um, then we now have a language that we can express, and then we get go from negative feedback, oh, I look like an idiot, to positive feedback, hmm, I'm improving, what else can I learn? So that little shift is the mechanism by which we get better. And as we do that over and over and over again, we can become um, uh, way better uh, and, and feel much more, much more comfortable as we begin to see different models and as we see different variations. So we've got tooth people, ice cream people. Um, and uh, so we'll talk more about those in the next um, uh, uh, workshop. Um, and I don't think we're gonna get through everything today um, uh, as quite a rich content. But let me just show you some examples that you might find 
um, uh, interesting. So not long ago, I was, was a, a, a colleague was asked for some coaching and she said, um, uh, hey, you know, my team doesn't really understand my goals. They're unresponsive. They don't really follow through. Research is complicated and nuanced. She ran uh, a research division. I need to manage them carefully. And I thought, huh, I don't really get what you're saying. But then I asked her, could you just draw me a picture of what you um, of what your ideal team looks like? And so she said, yeah, I got it. It looks like this. And this is what she drew, a picture of herself, me, and then uh, a bunch of people with the lines around it, three arrows. What would you say to her? <laughs> so this is her mental model. She was quite enthused by it. And I asked her, what do you mean by this? And she says, well, and I asked her a series of questions such as, um, what does that cloud represent? And she said, well, that's the protection that I offer my team, it's the guardrails. And why you're outside of it? Well, it's because I have to manage them and I need to keep distance to keep perspective. Why are the arrows going in one way? And so she had different reasons for the arrows. The top one was um, describing what they, uh, the research that she needed to do. Um, the uh, middle is the, the process. Uh, sorry, my thing is kind of going by, by itself here. And then I showed her a couple of other visual models that she could use to uh, think about her mental model uh, of, um, uh, of collaboration. So some time, a couple of weeks later, she said, hey, that was great. Uh, that really helped me a lot. And I said, yeah, so, so what, what does that mean for you? And she said, well, I'm leaving the company and I'm going to become a consultant. <laughs> Um, and which was perfect because it represented her mental model of, of it. So do you see the, the, the value of this? So, you, you know, we think of visualization to um, explain data and content and the hard facts, super useful for that, but it's also useful for the other aspects of, of uh, life and communication, equally, equally valuable. And so making nodes is really about figuring out um, um, the key key um, uh, parts here um, of the system. So I'm gonna, um, I think we're gonna get to be, to go to about as far as, um, uh, I think what I'd like to do is to just give you an overview of territories. And then I'm gonna um, leave with some science examples of, of uh, nodes and links and territories. Um, and then we'll, um, we'll continue next week with with um, the uh, you know associating data and different types of causation to the different parts of these visual models and how various practical applications of how you'd use them. So as the as we've illustrated before, there is actually um, oops. Um, you can arrange nodes and links into different structures. So this is another part of the visual language. So we've gone from just drawing to organizing information on visual spaces. So there is actually a whole language of um, visual uh, uh, thinking of a deck of cards, which I'll share with you what this actually looks like. And there is an underlying structure or topology for each line that will um, representation that can reflect the reality of what we're trying to explain express, whether it's a physical phenomena or a decision to be made or um, some, some other topic. So you're familiar with all of them. We've all seen them before. It's rare to actually see them all at once and see the underlying uh, structure. But when we understand the value of each of these, we can plot information on differing uh, structures, whether it's squiggles or circles or triangles or two by two matrices or squares, something called a crazy eight. Um, blobjects, and in some cases they're, they're driven by um, intuition, in other cases <clears throat> they can be used for data-driven context. So again, depending on what job you're trying to use and what mode of thinking you're trying to represent, there's different um, um, uh, elements. Systems models, by the way, truly have stocks and flows, we'll get to those next time, but for the, for the time being we're just really illustrating the simple part here. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so um, by learning the language of these and basically copying them, learning and, and borrowing them, we boost up our language just as we boost up our language of how we learn to solve equations, how we learn to um, 
uh, perform other, other, other types of mental actions. Um, I'm going to just play a little bit from um, a training program that uh, together and then kind of where you can kind of see the structures. So the break here and let the video go. So let's look at some simple diagrams. Use lines to arrange, sequence, and to sort things. Lines allow you to place nodes. They could be objects, events, people, actions, concepts, whatever you need to illustrate along a linear scale and see their relationship along a single dimension. Squiggles or curvy lines chart the relationship between two factors, say between stock price and time, or product popularity and maturity. You can use them to plot trends, but you can also use them to plot information along a predetermined curve, such as a hype curve, a product chasm curve, or a power law curve. Triangles bring together three factors. You can use them to map hierarchy, trade-offs, and forces. A square establishes a solid grid combining rows and columns into cells or nodes, and we use them endlessly for spreadsheets but we can also use them to generate new information and force connections in idea matrices. And it goes on, there, there's um, uh, well, it's about 30 or so fundamental, 20 that, that do kind of most work in business and I think in science. And um, <clears throat> by learning the language, kind of like just learning the alphabet, you can use these and to express, communicate, communi uh, uh, collaborate and um, sell more, more effectively. I'm just going to show you two other examples and then we're going to um, uh, break for now, maybe have just a couple of room for questions. Imagine all the stars that we see in the night skies, the astrophysicists in the room will know that um, if we take stars and we plotted their intrinsic brightness against their color temperature or the classifications, <coughs> excuse me, the stars themselves are not randomly distri distributed. They're actually, they occur over several specific uh, locations. And so this simple realization, this you know, plotting of uh, what seems to be random information or properties actually provides uh, an illustration of the deep underlying structure of stellar uh, formation. And it's, um, it, 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 it's, again, this first year stuff, but it's um, a really powerful tool to not only see the nodes, which are the individual stars, and then their placement in the territories, and also the links that show the path as they evolve through their various spectrums. So again, something as rich and as robust um, as the hertzsprung russell diagram is all built out of these single, um, uh, simple elements. So making territory um, visible is this powerful tool. Um, and that's true of something you know that we're all familiar with, such as the periodic table. So the periodic table looks like this, right? This is what we see in every chemistry high school chemistry room as well. But it's kind of a standard that has been uh, that we're fixated upon. And looking at the history of chemistry, we see that there's actually um, a remarkable collection of visualizations of the distribution and relationship of constituent elements. Of element parts. So from 1867, you know, kind of even before the time of Mendeleev, around the time, I guess he wasn't really fully published or where yet. Here's what elements actually looked like when they were plotted. And we begin to see the periodicity of, of elements, how their properties go through these various cycles. Um, a few years later in 1860, um, the, there were visualizations that looked like this with their atomic weights. And then just a few years later, an actual 3D visual model. And it goes on and on and on and continues. And all these brilliant visualizations showing something um, and actually this physical model um, uh, and you know, paper models that show the internal structure. 
um, of, of elements, and they're all accurate. No single model is correct, but each illustrates some aspect of reality over other aspects. And so again, um, I think one of our jobs as communicators and as researchers is to figure out the best type of visual representation that suits the job to be done. And so um, there's a functional fixedness that occurs um, that we can thaw out by adopting different types of visual models. So again, these are some um, examples. I think at the latest count, there's about 1300 published variations of the uh, periodic table. And um, there, some of them are just gorgeous and they, you we get an intuitive and also an analytical sense of them that we just don't get with the traditional models. So from a research and a scientific perspective, it's a really um, powerful tool. So we can find parts of the system when we represent systems, the nodes, the links, and the patterns, we can see the systems in fresh ways. So we're gonna pause now for, for, um, um, for, for now, and we'll continue this on uh, to the next one. I was hoping to share with you some really rich um, examples of visualizations of uh, oh, yeah. types of uh, real-time visualizations that we see that are all based on nodes, links, visualizations and much more, but we will cover uh, those in, in our next week. So um, we have uh, one minute now. So I would like you, um, uh, those of you who are on the chat to do um, two things. Number one, uh, type in, what did you learn? Um, so just type a sentence that asks, what did you learn from this? And then secondly, um, a question that you'd like to ask. So this, uh, so what didn't you know? What could I do better? What um, uh, what problem would you like to have me visualize? Um, you know, something that's really relevant to you. So before you go, uh, I would really appreciate that sixty seconds um, of of putting in some time of and, and typing into us um, in the chat. What um, what did you learn uh, from this? And then secondly. What uh, would you like to? Um, what would you like to have us explore in terms of specific diagrams, approaches, systems models, visualizations, analytical methods, whatever you're, you're, you're interested in, um, that would be relevant to you. So I'm going to pause here for now, and hopefully Torrance will come in. Tom, <clears throat> hi Laura here. I'm going to toss out a question just because I can. Um, uh, what is your experience? So it's one thing to know your field and then look for ways to describe it or your field or your process or your project. What if you're at the very early, you know, incoherent idea, even before the brainstorm, you know, before brainstorming, you are racking your brain, noodling around something. Yeah. How, and, and any any how do you any, visual think to help organize your thinking mm -hmm. yeah so one of the um, um really um great methods is something called um the mind dump Let's see if i have um, an example of that play handy here so mind dump is um is nothing more than um simply To, uh... oh, let me just bring up a, you know, I'll, I'll show, show it next time. Next time. Um, a mind dump is nothing more than uh, writing out ideas on sticky notes, digital or physical, and getting all of your ideas out um, into, um, onto a shared, uh, into a persistent visual surface. And so, um, and that can be anything so like you know what what are the questions that you're uh, uh, interested in asking what are the uh, concerns what are the big ideas what are your hunches you know what are the etc cetera, etc cetera, and get them all out onto a shared surface and what, again what that does is it gets it out of your head onto a surface where you don't need to juggle them but instead can see them all at at, uh, at once um, and then go through a secondary process of then uh, reviewing and then sorting clustering clustering them, and then you're performing a mental action uh, visually. And um, it's, it's interesting, I, I um, with often very senior people, when I ask them to do that, they go, come on, that's just, isn't that kind of junior? I mean, 
And then they intone that, you know, because I'm at such a level of seniority and maturity, I don't need to do that because, well, look at me <laughs> or something along that, that line. But then when I cajole and um, get them to actually start writing things out or have them say things one at a time and the dam break, it starts to flow and you see they, they shift from being like that to, hmm, to that, to, to building in. So it's the experience of doing that. So I would encourage you to, to, to actually do these activities as opposed to just think about them and evaluate them. It's the experiential aspect of visual thinking. Visual thinking is different from verbal thinking. It's a kinesthetic process as well. So, you know, multiple, you know, get your thoughts out, uh, organize them into clusters, reflect on them. Um, and then there are other activities we can talk about later as well. So I'll, I'll come back in the later workshops to the specific um, exercise that many on this stream will, will relate to a rapid prototyping. But I actually wanna close with a, I think a perfect question from Shelley and uh, who points out visual components correspond to procedural ideas, right? To, to, this is, how does a visual grammar deal with uncertainty or indeterminacy? Hmm. So um, first I would challenge you on, on um, the, the visual expression because I think visual expressions can, can take different uh, forms. So dealing with uncertainty um, is, so that is one of the, the trade-offs of visual thinking. So there are things called uncertainty cones when we can um, uh, visualize um, probability. But visualizing probability um, visually visualizing probability can feel different than, um, than, than an equation or um, other, other forms. Um, so every mode of thinking, I believe, introduces a particular bias. And so we, we need to um, be mindful of what are the biases that we add and we subtract. subtract. You gain some things with visual thinking, but you lose things with visual thinking um, as well. So what's I think really critical is that visual thinking is one of the several types of tasks. We actually um, build this out in um, the, um, uh, the our um, wicked problem solving format here. It's um, a toolkit that uh, we've launched that um, helps um, knowledge workers select the type of thinking that they uh, perform by organizing work through different kinds of plays. A play is a time-bound course of action that consists of a question, some type of visual representation, and then a task that you perform. The task can be visual, it can be kinesthetic, it can be a prototype, it can be an equation, it can um, be different forms, but you kind of assemble them together like Lego blocks into a systems model to figure out the right way of, of moving forward. So that's kind of beyond the scope of this uh, program here, but <clears throat> um, um, there is, an, um, I think people who, <clears throat> we need to adopt the right type of, we need to have a strategy for our strategy. We need to select the type of thinking that will suit the nature of the problem that we, we pick. And so <clears throat> modern problem solving um, needs a framework to be able to identify whether we do prototyping or design thinking or lean or agile or, you know, um, study behavioral economics or just do straight equation calculation, whatever may happen to be, each of these are tools that we can bring together to the plays that we, we have. So again, if you're, you're interested in, in, in learning more about um, this, um, I can talk a little bit more about it next time. But for those of you who are interested, you can go to... Um, where are we? Wicked Problem Solver, Wicked Problem Solver, and um, and find out more about that. So um, I think that's all for for now. And yeah. uh, thanks everyone for your for your time. I hope you found this useful and and fruitful, and that you can uh, draw something before breakfast. So, uh, uh, Laura, if you could uh, catch up the the, um, the the text messages, we can regroup and and see what uh, what emerges from that. Okay, everyone. Folks, we'll put links to some of these um, resources in the discussion tab on Polyplexus on the, on the